Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. In this video, we're going to learn how to use Unity's game server hosting to automatically host dedicated servers for multiplayer games. With this, you can make a dedicated server build of your game, then upload it to the cloud on the Unity dashboard, and after that, it will create multiple instances of that server build so the players can play. The system automatically scales the number of servers up or down depending on demand. And also, by the way, this is a tool that used to be called Multiplay, so it's the same thing, they just renamed it to Game Server Hosting. And also, this tool is already extremely mature and production ready. For example, this is exactly what Apex Legends uses to manage their server infrastructure. So basically, if it can handle a game on that massive scale, then it can certainly handle your games. Now, for this tutorial, first I'm going to show you how to use Game Server Hosting in general with a given build. And then I'm going to show you how I made the dedicated server build for my Kitchen Chaos multiplayer game, the specific change that I had to make to make it work. So it's also a tutorial on how to use netcode for game objects combined with game server hosting. Also, by the way, in case you don't know, this game was fully built from scratch in my two free courses, one on making the game in single player and a second one on making it multiplayer. There is one really sneaky thing with regards to how netcode for game objects works that took quite a bit of refactoring to make this work. And it was also quite a bit tricky to figure out how to make the proper dedicated server build. I really couldn't find any info on specifically using game server hosting combined with netcode for game objects. So hopefully this video will be very useful to a bunch of people. If you find it helpful, go ahead and hit the like button. You can download the complete project files for this video and inspect to see how it all works. And beyond that, this tool helps you start and stop dedicated servers. Then Unity has another tool which combines very well with this one, which is Matchmaker. With that one, you can create matches to group players together. And then that tool can talk to game server hosting to spin up a new server instance for those players to play. I'm also going to cover how to use Matchmaker in the next video. And also, this video is sponsored by Unity. Okay, so like I said, I will first cover how to use game server hosting in general, assuming you already have a server build, and then I will show you how I made the server build for my game. So first thing we do is just like any other Unity gaming services tool, let's go to the Unity dashboard, then up top select your project, then on the left side go into multiplayer, and then up here we have game server hosting. Right away we've got a nice setup multiplayer button, so let's go ahead and click. Now this one actually takes some setup, so let's just wait for this complete. Okay, setup is complete, so now let's follow these steps. First one is integrate with your game server, and as you can see this tool is multi-platform. For example, like I mentioned, Apex Legends uses this tool, but it is not made with Unity. So here you have a Unity SDK, Unreal SDK, and you can also use it with a custom engine through the API. Here we're going to use Unity, so let's go with that. Next step is link the project. So open up your Unity, and first of all up here on the top left corner, make sure you are signed in. If you're not, if instead of seeing your name you see a button saying sign in, if so, then go ahead close Unity, then open up Unity Hub, make sure you are signed in there, and then open the project. If you are signed in, then go into Edit, then into Project Settings. And then over here on the left side, under Services, this is where you can create a Unity Project ID. So just go ahead, select it, and create it. Or if you already made one in the dashboard, then let's go through the other menu, use an existing Unity ID, and just select it. So here I've selected the project, and I'm going to link it. Okay, great, so far so good. Now back in the dashboard, okay, we already did this, great. And the next step is to install the actual package. So this one has to be installed through the name. The package does not show up on the package manager by default. So let's go ahead and make sure to copy this one to the clipboard. And then back in the project, let's go into window, into the package manager. And up top, let's go into the plus sign and let's add a package by name and pass in the exact same name. Make sure you don't make a mistake, make sure you write everything perfectly and let's go ahead and add. And yep, there it is, the multiplayer package has indeed been installed. Okay, great. Now with this package in your project, this is how you can then create the build. Like I said, I'm going to cover this in more detail in the second part of this video. For now, let's keep going, assuming you already have a working server build. So back in here, let's finish the setup. The next one is to create a build, so let's go with that. This one requires a build name. You can have different builds with different names, or you can also just create one build name and then update the files. So here, I'm going to name this something like build A. Then for the operating system, let's go with Linux. This is for the server build, not the actual player build. And for the upload method, you can either upload the files directly or you can use a container image. So you can pre-prepare a Docker container and just upload that. Either option works. In my case, I'm going to use the simpler direct file upload, so let's go in next. And even now, you can just drag and drop the files in order to upload them. So here I have my files, I just made a regular Linux build. So just go ahead, select all the files and drag them. And there you go, let's just upload. All right, so all the files have been uploaded. Let's go ahead, click on next. And yep, we created the build with this name. We have the first version. Okay, finish. 
So now that we have build, we need to create a build configuration, which is what defines how the build will run. So over here, let's begin by giving it a name. So let's say build config A. And for the build, let's select the build that we just uploaded, okay? Then for the executable, in this case, the Linux executables have an extension of x86-64. So if we just search for 86, yep, there you go, we do find the file. Okay, that's it. Then for the query type, this is for getting analytics from your build. And the Unity package, that one uses SQP, so let's go ahead and choose this one. And finally, down here, we have the launch parameters. With this, you can add whatever flags you want to your dedicated server build. That can be helpful to make sure that it runs different logic. Now, in this case, the defaults all look great, so the port, don't remove any of these. Let's just add just dash no graphics in order to make sure that our server build does not have any rendering. Okay, so that's it. With this, we have our build configuration, so let's click on next. Then here are some config variables. You can read these from inside the game. So if you want to pass in some extra data to the server as it runs, you could use this. For example, if you want to enable some debug mode or give all players visibility or something like that. But in our case, let's just leave them on the defaults. So let's go. Then here we need to set the usage settings. So the CPU speed and the memory. Now these numbers are obviously going to vary depending on what kind of game you're making. But after you have the build and the servers are running, you can then monitor to see how much it's using. Then you can come back here and modify these values. You can use defaults or we're going to custom and just input anything. So for starters, let's go with defaults. This is more than enough for our simple game. Okay, let's go ahead and finish. And actually, as soon as I try that, I got an error. That is because the build needs to be synchronized. So if this happens to you, very simple, just wait a little bit. Basically, the files that were uploaded, they need to be synchronized to the Unity service. So let's just wait a little bit before clicking on finish again. And if there you go, now it worked. Okay, great. So we have our build configuration set up. The next thing we need is down here to create a fleet. Basically, a fleet is a collection of servers running a certain build on a certain region. So let's go ahead and create a brand new one. Let's give it a name like Fleet A. Then, yep, we are using Linux. And let's go ahead and select our build config. Okay, great. Let's go next. Then for the region, later on, you can also add more regions to a fleet. For now, since I'm in Europe, I'm just going to select Europe. Okay, great. Then for the minimum and maximum servers, like it says here, if you put a minimum above zero, if you do that, then you will have some costs, even if no one is playing the game. So if you are trying to limit costs, then definitely make sure over here on the minimum, put zero. And for the maximum servers, again, this is going to depend on your game, but just for testing, let's just go with one. That's more than enough. Okay, let's go ahead and finish. So with that, we have a build, we have a build config and a fleet, all of that set up. Now let's verify that it's all working by making a test allocation. So here, let's go ahead, select the fleet, select our region and select the build config. Let's go on next. And yep, let's go ahead and run the text. So that is going to request an allocation and now it is waiting for the server. And yep, we can see the server has been allocated. We can see the server IP and port. So let's go ahead and finish. And if on the side, we go into the servers menu, Yep, here we do see a list of all the servers. So we can inspect this one, which has been allocated. We've got a bunch of analytics. Then we can see a bunch of events. And then over here, we can see a log. And yep, this is essentially the log that Unity generates. So right away, we can see that it is running with no graphics. And if we scroll down, we can see all of the regular logs. So in my case, I've got a bunch of debug.logs in order to see which scene the dedicated server is in. So over here, we can see that it did allocate some resources. It got a port where it should allocate and allocate it in there. And now it is ready to receive the players. Okay, so now here I have my regular game build. I go inside multiplayer and yep, right away I do see two ways of joining a server. I can see a server list and it shows me the server IP and port. Or down here I've got two text boxes so I can input the IP and port and join by IP. So with either of these, if I click on it, yep, there you go connecting and yep, there you go, it connected to the final dedicated server. Now everything else plays as normal. So over here I can set as ready. And yep, it goes into the main game and now I can play the game as normal. All right, awesome. So everything is working in the game. And here in the dashboard, we can verify that it is working. So let's just refresh this log. So let's just change page, come back here. And there you go, the log is refreshed so we can see it. And yep, I can see one client did connect. It went as ready and loaded the final scene. Okay, great. So everything is working perfectly. Now, one more option that I added over here into the game is the ability to create a server. Now I'm going to talk about this part a bit more in a little bit, but in most cases, you probably would not expose this button to the players. You don't want players to manually be able to create tons of allocations, which you then have to pay for. So I made it here just for testing. I can click on this button. And yep, with that here, I have a successful allocation. And over here, yep, we can see we do have two servers allocated. And on server list, yep, I do see both servers. 
So I can join this brand new one, connecting, and it's inside and everything else works as normal. Okay, so everything is working perfectly. Now let's see how I made the build work. By the way, like I mentioned, this game that I'm using here, Kitchen Chaos, this is a game that I built entirely in the previous two free courses. So if you want to see how all the code is set up and how all of this was built from scratch, go watch those. Here for making the dedicated server build, the main thing is you must automate the process for getting the build to a state where it is ready to accept players. So in the case of this game, first it starts off on the main menu, then we go into the multiplayer scene, and only then we can create a game, which then goes into the character select scene, and it's only in here that it's actually creating the connection. So basically, for the dedicated server, we need to skip all of those steps until we get here. So how I did that, how I handled that dedicated server logic, is over here on the script compilation, I defined a defined symbol for dedicated server. Then over here in the code, I can make some logic specific just to the dedicated server. So for example, I have this script placed on the main menu, so it just does an if test for that symbol, and if so, it just does a log and loads the lobby scene right away, so automatically. And then on the lobby scene, I've got the regular kitchen game lobby. And on this script, it does a bunch more dedicated server logic. The important one is right here, after initializing the Unity services, you need to make sure to only call multiple events after this one. So after that, here we have an if. If so, then it first of all listens to some server events. And then the important one is actually the multiplay allocation. So over here it gets the server config to see if it has already been allocated. If so, then it goes and runs this function. And then this function down here is pretty simple. Just grabs the data related to this server. Specifically, the most important one is over here, the port. It sets the connection data, and then importantly, it starts a server. Note how it's start server, not start host. So this function really does exactly the same thing as start host, just with a different function call. Again, remember the differences between server, host, and client. So it starts the server and loads the character select scene. But actually, before it does that, over here, the important thing for setting the connection data, for this one, it goes into the NT transport in order to set it up. And for the port that we use is the one that we get here from the multiplay service. This one gives us a bunch of data, but in order to set it up with netcode for game objects, all we really need is just the port. And also make sure you use the port, not the query port. Those are two different things. And one extremely important thing is over here, the listen address. This one is an optional parameter. You can leave it as null. However, if you do, if you omit this parameter, if you do it like this, then it will not work. The server will not be reachable. This actually took me quite a bit of time to figure out. If you don't like this, it won't work. You must make sure to listen and must make sure to listen on this IP. So 0.0.0.0. So don't forget this. And over here for the IPv4, I actually don't think this one is actually necessary. I tried this with 0000 or 127001 and either one worked. So it seems like the super important parts is over here, the port. So you must make sure to use the same one as over here. And you must make sure to listen on this IP. If you don't, then it will not connect. Okay, so with all that, the transport is set up. So then you can start the server. And then it just loads the character select scene, which in turn runs this script. And on this script, we've got some more dedicated server logic. At this point, the server is ready to accept for players. So that is why we call this function. So this basically tells the multiplayer service that, yep, this server has reached a ready state, so it is ready to accept players. Now, since we can set as ready, we also need to set as unready. Basically, when we made the game in the free course, we decided that the player should only join during this character select scene. After the game starts, it should no longer accept players. So for that logic, I added here on the kitchen game manager, which only runs on the game scene. And for this one, over here on the start, once again, doing an if on the dedicated server. And if so, just set the server as ready. Also one minor thing, the log was getting tons of warning messages that were just cluttering the log. So to solve that, I just set the camera.main enabled to false. That disables the camera, which solved that error. Okay, so with all of that, that is really all you need. With this server gets created, it automatically gets to a state ready to accept players and then gets state to get unready. Then for some other things, back here on the lobby script, when we are initializing the server, yep. Over here, there is a function call to start server query handler. This is basically the SQP server query protocol that we saw a while ago. This basically lets the server talk to multiply directly. Although I'm still not entirely sure what would be the main purpose for that. Maybe it's to make it work with matchmaker. I'm not sure yet, but still you must call this function in order to start the SQP. This function then returns an object of this type. So an I server query handler. And then based on the documentation, you should call a function on the every update. So let's see down here where I have the update. Here it is. So some more dedicated server logic. If that one is set, really the only thing is I'm setting the current players. 
so that if you go over here onto the dashboard and you go inside a server, over here for the concurrent users, you will see that update if you set that field. So you can set this field, although this one is optional. The one that they really require you to do, as it says in the documentation, is on every update, make sure to send an update server check. This lets the multiplayer backend know that this server is still alive and active. Then for something else, for connecting to the server, there's this input field and this button that I showed. So here is a script and it's very simple. Just on click, just grab the text from both input fields. Just go into the NT transport, set the connection data, so the IPv4 and the port, and just start the client. That's it, super simple. The tricky part was actually making the server browser. The tricky part is because that feature, that ability, that one is not over here on the multiplayer service. So if you just use the package, you can't actually get the server list. Over here, you just got the server config, ready and ready and so on. You don't have anything to list any servers. Instead, that part actually exists on the web API. In order to use this web API, you need to create a service account. So back in the dashboard, go into projects, then over here, go into service accounts, and here you can create a brand new service account. When you do, then you can generate a key, and then down here, you can give it some permissions. The important one for the server browser is the multiplayer API viewer. After that, you can now access this web API from anywhere, like for example, inside Unity. And for the endpoint, it's the one, the servers, the enlist servers. So this one returns all of the servers. Although do note that this API call requires authentication. You can see in the services web API docs for how that works. And basically you need to send as an authorization header. So you grab the key ID, the secret key, you concatenate both those strings and generate a base64 and use that for the authorization. So over here in the code, that's exactly what I'm doing. So I've got the key ID, I've got the key secret. Then I convert it into a byte array and I use convert to base64 in order to get the key base64. Then for the project ID and the environment ID, for those you can get them from the dashboard. So for the project ID, just click up here onto the project settings. And up here is the project ID. And for the environment ID, Go to somewhere like over here, the server list, and over here we can see the environment, so let's go and manage them. And up here we do see the environment ID. So when we have all that data, then it's just doing a basic get request. And for this, I used my web request class that I created in a previous video. And since then, I also updated it with some more features. And to make this work, I had to modify it to support also sending custom headers. I included this class in the project files for this video. Basically, I just made it take an action which receives a Unity web request. So with this, I can set the request header and over here I can set the authorization. With that, I am authenticating this request and then just call the regular URL. Then we can see on the web API what exactly it returns. So we can see that it returns an array and each object is going to be a different server. It's going to have the IP, the port, the status and so on. Although actually one note, which is the JSON that this returns is somewhat malformed or at least it doesn't parse automatically using Unity's built-in JSON utility. So for this to work, I had to manually put it inside a server list field. Here is the type that I'm using. So I've got a server list and then each server has all this data. And for using all that data, I just did a basic visual. So the same thing that I did so many things during that course, pretty much just instantiating a template, setting the button click in order to connect to this IP on this port. And for doing that, just goes through the Unity transport. So exactly the same as previously. Now, one missing piece is how to create new allocations. So right now we saw how to do it by creating a test allocation, but like name implies, this is just a quick allocation just for testing. In final game, you want some regular allocations. In most cases, you're actually going to be doing that through Matchmaker, which I'm going to cover in the next video, but you can also make it manually without Matchmaker. However, the way you do it is also a little bit tricky. For some reason, over here on the dashboard, there's no way to create a regular allocation, just test allocations. But you can do it through yet another web API. This one is different from the previous one that I showed. It's actually took me a while to figure out since there are two completely separate ones. On this one down here, we do have an endpoint in order to queue an allocation request. This one does require some authorization. In order to create new allocation, we need to have this permission. So over here, back in the services account, then here you need to add the multiple allocations admin. And then for this specific API, instead of using basic authentication like the previous one for the server browser, for this one, you need to use the token exchange API in order to do a bare authorization. The way you do it is pretty simple. You just send to the token exchange API, you send that the authorization basic, and then you get the return value, which is going to be the access token, and then you use that on the bare authorization. So that's exactly the code that I have here. I've got my key ID, my key secret. I create a base64. Then with that, the first thing I do is a post JSON. And for the JSON request body, I send in the scopes that I want. So in this case, multiple allocations create. And for the endpoint, I'm going to go into the token exchange. 
So I'm going to send in the base key 64, and that one is going to return the actual JWT token. So with that, I can now use authorization bearer, pass in that token, and I can access the multiply services in order to create a brand new allocation, and yep, it allocates. Now honestly, for this specific thing, I'm not entirely sure what are the best practices here, but I'm pretty sure that you shouldn't give the players the ability to manually allocate servers themselves. So this would probably be in some kind of game backend where only you, the developer, control. You can check how many players are playing the game, and if all of these servers are full, then manually allocate some more. So in the final game, you would not have a create server button like I have here. The players would only see the server list and the join IP. So with that, pretty much everything is working, except for a very sneaky issue to do with netcode for game objects alongside some regular problems. For those regular problems, basically the issue is how the game was made thinking there was always a host. That's how I developed the game in the course. One example is over here on the tutorial UI. On this one, this message does show directly on start, but then for hiding it, it was only being hidden over here when the local play ready changed. Now obviously that makes sense if you got a host, the host is going to set as ready and everyone needs to be ready, so this will always trigger, but on the server, if there's no input, then it just never hides. The server itself does not have a local player, so if you make it just a server build, then over here this will never run, so this window will never hide. Now in this case, it's not necessarily a problem because the server isn't really going to use any visuals. Another similar example is over here on the delivery manager. Now for this one, for adding a recipe, first of all, over here on the update, it runs the spawn recipe timer, it counts down and then spawns a recipe. So it generates a brand new random recipe index. And then for spawning that, it does that through a client RPC. So it goes in here and adds it to the waiting recipe as own list. Now when the game made in the course, this worked fine since the host works as both a server and a client. So the host would still run this logic and the host would still add the waiting recipe to the list. However, over here we just have a server, meaning the server is not a client, so the server is never going to run this client RPC. So the issue that we have here is that the server will never spawn recipes, will never add them to their own list, so the server will just keep spawning recipes forever since this list will never have any elements. The solution is to make sure to add the waiting recipe list directly on the server code. However, we also need to make sure not to add double the recipes in case we are working with a host. So the way that I solve that is like this. Basically, I just made a function for adding a recipe to the list. So this is just a regular function, so not a server or client RPC, just a regular function. Then up here, when we generate a brand new recipe, we're going to call that function so that the server or the host will run this code and add it to the list. And then it's going to fire a client RPC. And importantly, over here on this client RPC, it is going to test if it is a server, if so, return, so it is not going to do anything. So this way, the server is going to add it through this method, and the clients are going to add it through this method. With that, all of them will have the same waiting recipe list. So that's one example of a problem that only happens if playing as a server and does not happen if playing as a host. Another much, much more serious problem has to do with server RPCs. Basically, if you have code running on a server, meaning not a host, just a dedicated server, if you have some code like that and you try calling a server RPC, then nothing will happen. The server does not run server RPCs if they are initiated by the server. It will run them if the client calls a server RPC, but it will not run them if it is initiated by the server. Now this is something that confused me for quite a long time, I actually thought this was a bug. I asked in the forums, but apparently it's normal, meaning that in order to fix this one issue required quite a bit of refactoring. For example, over here on the cutting counter, if we go down to where we are cutting, so here we have the interact alternate, this is where we are actually cutting the object. So here it uses a server RPC in order to cut the object. This part does have some issues since it just goes through the client RPC, so it doesn't go through the server, but still the more important issue is actually on the second one for testing the cutting progress. So this one is a server RPC, so the client is going to run this code because only the client is actually going to cut the object. So the client is going to call this function and run the server RPC. So then this function down here, this one is actually going to run on the server. So that's fine, so far so good. However, then for destroying and spawning objects, these are only going to happen on the server. If we follow this function call, we go into this one and we have another server RPC. And the issue is that this code over here, this one is not going to run. So going back the interact alternate, this one runs on the client and the client calls this server RPC. Then this server RPC runs on the server. And then if the server tries to call this function, it is going to run this code, which is going to try to call the server RPC. But whilst on a server RPC, you cannot run a server RPC. So this code will never execute. So nothing will ever happen. This is the really sneaky issue, which is really strange. If you have any code running on the server and you want to execute that code on the server, then you cannot make it a server RPC. You need to make a regular non-RPC function in order to call it from the server. 
If you try to call a server IPC from inside a server, then you won't be very confused because this does not throw an error. It doesn't do anything. It simply literally does not run this code. So nothing actually happens. The solution that I did here is pretty much the same thing. So I just made a non server RPC function just to actually destroy the object. And then on the code to destroy an object, if it is a server, then I'm going to call the regular non server RPC function. And if it is not the server, then I'm going to call the server RPC, which then won't run it normally. This was really tricky to figure out. Nothing was being synchronized, even though the code was actually the same. It took me a while to figure out this solution, which is simply you cannot call server RPCs from inside a server. So basically I just right clicked on the server and the client RPCs and I just find all the references and I just went through all of them and make sure that I didn't have any chain server RPC calls. For example, here on the plates counter for handling the code to generate a brand new plate, here I'm using a server RPC, which then tells all the clients to spawn the plates. But again, this code is running on the server, so this will never run, this will never do anything. So the solution over here is just split it, just make a non-server, non-RPC function, just a regular function to run the regular code. Then I call this one directly from the server and I call the other client RPC and make sure it doesn't run twice on the server. So I just went through all my list of RPCs, made all those fixes, and with that change, everything else worked perfectly. Also, by the way, for testing, since we made over here the dedicated server defined symbol, like this, it is going to run the dedicated server code and we can just rename this. So just put something else, just whatever it is as long as it's different and now it will no longer run the dedicated server code. Just make sure to click on apply and that's it. So when I was testing, I would make a dedicated server build. I make the build and upload it, then rename this and run this build over here in the editor. With that, all of the code for the dedicated server no longer runs, so I can run this as a regular build. Okay, so after all that, here is the working demo. I can either create a test allocation or create a manual allocation. And there you go, got success, everything was allocated. If I look in the server list, I can see a server has indeed been allocated. Then in my game, yep, I can see that server over here on the server list. So I can click on it to connect to the server. And yep, there you go, now other players can connect. And then we can all play together in a nice dedicated server. All right, awesome. Now the one missing piece here is how do you automate the server allocation? Right now it's pretty manual. You have to either do it in the dashboard or through the web API. It would be good to automate that part when players need a server. Well, for that second part, that is actually handled through Unity Matchmaker, which is their matchmaking tool. It's how you can create matchmaking tickets and group players together. Then when the matchmaker finds enough players to play a game, it allocates a new multiplayer server, which you can then automatically join. So that tool, the Unity Matchmaker, is what I'm going to cover in detail in the next video. For now, here you'll learn how to get started with game server hosting, which lets you run dedicated servers in the cloud. And you also learn how to combine it with netcode for game objects. There isn't much documentation on this specific combination, so if you like this video, go ahead and like the video. Check out the downloadable project files, and if you haven't, then go watch my complete free multiplayer course, which covers the entire creation of this multiplayer game and how we got to this point. Alright, hope that's useful, check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.